We're fortunate enough to be sitting by the pool at the Hotel Metropole, and we're going to be talking to Matt Fairfield, who is the founder and CEO of ANV, and uh, he has a lot to tell us about the state of the insurance industry and the reinsurance industry. So, Matt, what's going on at ANV these days? <laughs> well, we're insuring people. Uh, but this other, other this than is that, a wise thing. <laughs> lots of other things are going on. Good. Tell us um, about it. You may have noticed this past year we've been doing lots of things to try and build our business, uh, and we're continuing on the path. We've uh, started to retool our syndicate a bit. Uh, I like to say that we didn't buy a shiny new bike, but <laughs> we're shining the bike up, and it's in a lot better shape than when we bought it. We're very Good. pleased about that. We've added some great product lines and people to uh, a business that was you know, not in the best of shape when we purchased it, but now we think we're in great shape. Uh, okay. And the Lloyd's, the Lloyd's market, uh, you see a good future for it? Absolutely. Um, Lloyd's is a wholesale business slash specialty business. It's still the premier market in the world. It can't stand still, though. Uh, if you look at you know, the last 23 years or 30 years, it was the place, and you know, all roads led to that Rome of the insurance business. Yeah. And now you have other strong wholesale places like a Zurich, a Bermuda, a Singapore, and now Doha with the opening of QRE. Right. So money's fungible, and it moves to where it needs to be. So Lloyd's is going to have to adjust to that new reality, but I think there's a lot of talent in the marketplace, and as long as it's well organized and directed where it needs to be for its clients, we'll fare well. Good to hear. Uh, would you consider uh, the recent... Uh, deal between Aon and Berkshire Hathaway to be a step in the right direction or maybe not? I think it's a step in a direction. <laughs> right? um, and I think it's if you're transparent about it, uh, clearly the brokerage community is seeking no new forms of ways to bring uh, capital to their distribution control. Yeah. So if you look at what that deal does, it gives Aon some control over that amount of capital vis-a-vis -vis Lloyd's platform. And you've seen also Willis try to replicate that. Mm -hmm. And if you hear some of the buzz here in Monte Carlo, uh, you see a lot of the capital markets folks talking about how they can match capital market solutions up to different product lines other than property CAD. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a growing trend where you see people who are in control of distribution, generally speaking brokers, perhaps bankers in the near term, are going to seek ways to match up the supply of capital, which could, you know, the world capital markets are trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars. That's true. Whereas the reinsurance slash insurance community is, let's say, maybe a half a trillion, give or take a hundred billion. Five hundred and fifteen billion. Well, I think. there you go. But that was counting a lot of stuff that isn't usually counted. Uh, uh, so there you go. Yeah. But the point being, in that amount of capital, there can be some kind of institutional marketplace memory. So when things go wrong, people say, whoops, we better not do that again. But when you're matching up a capital market that is you know, multiple times or exponentially larger than the amount of capital we just described, you'll find lots of folks who won't have that institutional memory. Yeah. Or worse, they'll say, hmm, that happened to the other guy. That's not going to happen to me. Yeah. So the typical markets we used to see a correction because people had let the pendulum you know, swing too far. I don't necessarily think that's going to happen this time, and I think that's an, a really important thing that we have to manage as an industry, especially the insurers and the reinsurers, because if we're not careful, we may not be necessary or as necessary as we once were. That's very interesting. Uh, I know one of the other things that's been happening and certainly being talked about here uh, is all of the alternative capital, which is to say money from the capital markets, investments from the capital markets, coming into the reinsurance industry. Mm -hmm. Uh, how do you feel about that? Well, the reinsurance community had been pining for it for quite some time. That's true. And they, uh, they, they opened the Pandora's box or they let the genie out of the bottle, whatever analogy you want to use, and it's too late now. And it's going to start bringing more and more competition to where they would not want there to be competition. And uh, I think it's going to be difficult times. People are going to have to adjust to the fact that there's capital here in some shape or form that is surplus to what it used to be here. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily intelligent capital, but it's not going to go away. Because in the model I just spoke about, you know, the traditional, let's say, you know, finite risk marketplace, you know, if something happened of dramatic uh, import, people would notice it, step up and go, we better change our pricing or change our terms and conditions. Mm -hmm. With the capital markets, there's so much capital out there, 
and people look at it, especially the capital markets people, as a investment that is different to their portfolio right now, uncorrelated. Okay. It has an artificial value to them in some respects. So you have a lot of money chasing the same risk amount, at, at least for right now, uh, that's not necessarily guided in making sure the long-term solutions are there for the clients. That, that's, that's interesting as well because there actually is different institutions that are putting it in the market. I've, I've heard it said that the pension funds seem to be uh, very much in favor. They're very stable, they're long-term investors, whereas the hedge funds and the, the private equity people might just leave if they see a better opportunity elsewhere. Uh, well, I know a lot about that universe. <laughs> My okay. main shareholder is a pension fund. Yeah, um, I know. <laughs> and, you know, look, the pension funds, I, you know, especially the one we're partnered with, very fortunately, they ha don't have any less return requirements than anybody in the world. Mm -hmm. I think the thing we are able to enjoy with them is that you match the ultimate capital provider up to the opportunity. Whereas if you have a middle person like a PE fund or a hedge fund or a VC fund, you know, there's a bit more arbitrary nature to how they make their decisions. They're also a finite period of time. Okay. Whereas a pension fund generally, not, not always though, but generally has more flexibility from a timing perspective and can match up the opportunity to their capital cons you know, constraints in terms of time. Yeah, that would make sense. Uh, I, know, well, I know that uh, ANV was uh, in the running for, for Taurus and unfortunately uh, the deal didn't go through. Uh, you have anything uh, in mind to perhaps uh, replace it? Well, uh, that's a great question. And <laughs> if in fact I was interested in Taurus, um, we're looking for a platform still, right? And the platform we have right now, which is, it's a nice platform. It's a subscale Lloyd's business though. And we're, we're very clear on that. We want to grow to at least 500 million pounds of stamp capacity. Okay. That can be done organically. That can be done through m and It can be done with both, build and buy. Mm -hmm. And we're absolutely focused on that as well. And if we have the opportunity uh, where there's a balance sheet available as a partner or some specific opportunity from a perspective enabling one of our strategies, we will remain opportunistic. I mean, we, we certainly are here for the long term. This is not a private equity, you know, it's called flip, to use the word, yeah. where there is a finite period of time and they want to take it public at some point in time and, and move on to their next deal. Mm -hmm. uh, we're trying to build this for the long term. I hope I retire from this business someday 30 or 40 years from now. And if my kids want to be in insurance, I hope they apply for a job. Yeah, I hope, I hope mine goes into insurance. We'll see. <laughs> well, I think insurance is, is, is a great business. It's, uh, you know, banking's broken. We all know that. We sure do. And the, the worst thing for banking is it's not a repeatable business model, as we all know now. When you take the leverage opportunity and the gaming of the marketplace out of it, it's a very straightforward business and highly regulated right now. Yeah. Insurance business, because our clients need our products every single year, not on a one-off basis. It's got a very nice product cycle. You're bringing value every single year in a similar fashion, hopefully adjusting for what they need, and it enables commerce. So it's, uh, banking does too, but not with all the things they were doing before. Because you know, That's when you bring a product to a client or to a marketplace, it's supposed to enable the client's business, right? So I don't think high-speed trading or some of the other prop trading the banks were doing was to enable their client strategies. No. That was for themselves, right? That's right. I mean, a, a bank or investment banks are going to be, are supposed to be the dissemination of Fed policy, right? Of central bank policy. Nothing more than that. Unfortunately, it's true. Uh, talking about uh, expansion, uh, where does ANV write most of its business? Uh, well, we're a Lloyd syndicate, so we have know. a traditional mix of a decent amount in the States and then a, a, a variation across uh, Europe and a little bit in South America, a little bit in Asia right now. But we are absolutely going to expand further into Asia and South America. We don't think they're emerging economies. We think they're economies that are there right now where we can do some great business up, business in, excuse me. Okay, so you're, you're not, I mean, it's kind of a, a difficult period for some of the emerging markets. You're, you're not uh, particularly distressed by that? Uh, well, if you had a short-term <laughs> business strategy, it would be a problem, obviously. Uh, for us, it's opportunistic. Right? If a marketplace ever changes locally, regionally, or globally in terms of capital supply and demand, it'll enable our strategy and buy us time. Um, we know clearly delivering specialty products on a global basis that truly solve risks and needs, we know that will always be a need. Right, so whether, you know, right now Brazil is not as uh, in favor as it used to be, mm -hmm. uh, parts of Africa are. 
you know, it's going to ebb and flow just as capital does. Sure. So if you're ready to address the needs of your clients in those marketplaces, hey, you take what you what the marketplace offers you. Don't force your way in. Very good advice. You're here at the Rendezvous. You've been here before. Uh, what, what do you think of it? What's your main purpose in coming to this uh, rather, rather extended uh, conference? Well, there's a lot of capital providers here, whether they be reinsurers, whether they be brokers, whether they be actual banks or a bunch of funds of people like that who are either in the business mix right now or getting into the business mix. So since we're originators of risk, we'd want to understand what the appetite is for that origination, what the objectives for their capital is, what is the uh, duration mm -hmm. which they're willing to do things. And then we can figure out what's the right matching up for our partnership of the kind of products we write and where a capital market product might make sense or where it makes no sense or where it may become a threat to us. So it's uh, it's become far more educational than it used to be. Yes, it, it has. It used to be much more just let's have some nice lunches together and mm -hmm. see you same time next year kind of stuff. Yes, it did. Right now, everybody's got to come prepared and ready because things are, are changing every day in our business right now. Yes, they really are, aren't they? I mean, it's, it's driven by technology. It's driven by... Uh, all of the changes that have gone on in the, the capital markets with the, you know, the, the financial crisis, uh, etc. Do you, you see uh, what, any idea when, uh, when things might get back to normal or will they ever get back to normal? You mean the world capital markets? Yeah. I would say they'll never go back to where they were. Okay. Right? Um, you know, Spain, where I live right now, there's probably at least five years, maybe ten more years still. Wow. of dealing with the aftermath of what happened. Uh, it's a, a bit what happened in Japan, right? It, it, you know, the Nikkei, when things went down, the Nikkei was at a peak of 39,000. It's nowhere near 39,000 anymore, and it's not going back anytime soon. So if you want to use uh, that uh, Michael Lewis phrase, the new new, right? Uh, we're, we're at the new new, and we don't know where we're going, if you ask me. I mean, if you uh, think about the facts, the facts are... Europe is one third of the world GDP and Asia is one sixth. That's true. It roughly flips in 10 years. So, evolving your strategy for your clients and yourself as the capital markets and the capital flows change those regions, that's a seismic shift. It sure is. And really a snap of your fingers when you think of human history. So, it's interesting times. It's very interesting and, times. And Confucius <laughs> said, may you live in interesting times, right? Yes, and it's not treated as a joke, but as a curse. That's right. <laughs> Thank you very much, Matt. Appreciate Excellent. the time.